so basically I I'm we we're Facebook friends now, so we talk a little bit there. But I first met you at HustleCon, I think this event that I hosted in 2019. And you're one of the best people we've ever had. We've had hundreds of people. And I'll uh, I'll tell you why. Two things. The first, I think you spoke right when so this is Max. He started Grammarly. We'll do an intro in a second. But I think you spoke when you guys had just raised maybe a hundred million dollars at a billion dollar valuation or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was, uh, 120, uh, and, uh, I, we didn't disclose valuation at the time. Yeah. <laughs> but if I had to get, you, yeah. yeah, you didn't, uh, but I think I'd heard rumors and like, I just am guessing it was like in that range and it doesn't matter, but, yeah. but basically, um, I made a comment to you. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Right. And you, you kind of replied back. You weren't cocky, but you were very confident and still humble. But you kind of had a grin. And I forget exactly what you said, but it was something like, yeah, it's going to get much bigger, too. And I, I loved that, like, subtle confidence. And then at the event, what you talked about, I don't even remember the title, but the idea was basically, like, you're an engineer, but you've done a really good job of, like, evolving past just engineering and you like said, this is how like I engineer like good products. And this is how I, like everything you looked at was from an engineer, like uh, about reverse engineering different stuff. And I thought that was incredibly fascinating. You, do, do you remember what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, I do. I, I remember that. I, I actually <laughs> use that mantra a lot in, inside the company as well. When we look at uh, different markets and uh, where to go next. And uh, it's just a universally good framework that uh, uh, works for many things. Yeah, just kind of looking at uh, things narrowly, identifying the sweet spot, and then just going broader from there. So this is Max Litvin. Litvin, he started this company called Grammarly. Before Grammarly, you had another company called like Blackboard, I think, right? That was not my company. That was a company that bought my company. So my company was my Dropbox, uh, not to be confused That's with right. Dropbox. It was a plagiarism detection company, and uh, it was bought by Blackboard in 2007. Um, and then they spent two years with Blackboard, uh, kind of a part earn out part, just being, uh, being there. And yeah. that was like a, a, a compared to Grammarly, a mild success, right? Like it was, it was financially good, but it wasn't like this huge, huge multi-billion dollar company. Oh yeah. That was, uh, that was, uh, just a start. It could have grown big, uh, but education is was at that point a relatively difficult market to to be in and wasn't as big of a market uh plus our product was fairly narrow it was just doing one thing uh, for one group of people so we kind of saw that it can grow to this point but further it's going to be very slow and very difficult so that's why we decided to sell plus we had bigger ideas and you started grammarly and at this point can you reveal can you reveal how big it is because I, I like it's shockingly large. Yeah. Uh, so we raised at uh, thirteen billion uh, valuation, and we disclosed that valuation. I still think it's a conserv it's conservative one. Why? Because <laughs> <laughs> Grammarly is a very non standard company and very non standard product. Uh, it's easy to see it for less than it is, um, and uh, and that uh, that's. Uh, kind of reflected uh, often in, uh, in in perceptions of uh, of everyone, of investors, of uh, uh, sometimes even potential team members. We have to explain why it's big, and you know, but uh, that also helps with uh, less competition. Well, and like, and and by the way, you guys bootstrapped it for a long time. So like, you and your co co-founder, yeah. like, it's not like you own like four percent of this company. You guys probably you own like a, a very substantial amount. So like, actually, so well, you're. A, on paper, you're you're probably a multi-billionaire at this point. Uh, it depends on whom you believe. Uh, there is some information that's not fully accurate. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we we managed to keep significant portion of the company with the founders and employees. Um, employees own actually quite a lot. Did um, when I heard about Grammarly, the reason why I wanted you to come on to the podcast and at HustleCon is because I think my reaction is the same reaction most people in business had, which is like, A, this is just a Chrome plugin. B, this is just spell check. Like, there's no way that either of those things are interesting. And then I learned about it and I was like, oh, this is like way bigger than, it just looks like that. It's way more than that. 
did most people were like there's no, were most people dismissive of like it just being a Chrome plugin? Some people are dismissive, uh, quite a lot, and uh, I wouldn't say dismissive. Com it's not like completely oh, there's nothing, uh, but uh, underestimate the impact and the importance of it. And that's that's an interesting uh, conversation. Always, always very similar because um, they kind of think, oh, this is a good product. This is a cool product, but not for me because well, I, I know what I'm doing. Uh, and then uh, they try it, and uh, it helps. It helps in material ways, and uh, especially when you measure results. Because you know when you don't measure things uh, and and just you know typing away. Uh, it saves you from an embarrassment or helps you phrase something more clearly. Kind of, yeah, that's cool, but what's the impact of and that? Show me the money. But when it's done on the business scale uh, and it's measured and it's uh, kind of assessed, uh, you can see like percentages, improvements in, in me different metrics, productivity, satisfaction, and so on. And that adds up. That adds up pretty We quick. bought it at the hustle. So I, I had it for uh, the whole company. Um, I don't remember what it, what it, what it costs, but I remember seeing the bill every month, hundreds of dollars a month we, and everyone loved it and I loved it. I, I still use it. So like, I totally, I totally buy it. I, I totally, once I started using it, I was like, Oh my God, I get it. But one thing that I've always been fascinated with is, is just plugins as a business. Um, uh -huh. particularly two types of plugins, WordPress plugins. Um, there's a bunch of guys that have like some substantially size, substantial size businesses selling WordPress plugins, you know, like 25, 50 million dollars a year and then Chrome plugins, which do you, you I don't know if you like describe yourself as a Chrome plugin as a business. I, I don't think you are, but like it's definitely like the one of the main ways in which most people interact with you, right? Uh, for now, yes, uh, we just recently uh, switched over to our flagship product being uh, operating system level integration, so it works similarly to Chrome plugin, except it integrates with all the apps, not just web apps. Uh, so that's, uh, that was a big switch over that happened uh, uh, in uh, December. So just about a month ago. Um, so that's, uh, that expands the surface area for Grammarly. Now it's in Microsoft PowerPoint and uh, you know, Oracle applications and wherever, wherever you want. Basically. Wow. Um, did you, uh, why'd you hire a CEO and when did you do that? Uh, <laughs> it's kind of a jumping topics, but uh, yeah, we um, we brought in a, a CEO, I think, in 2011. Uh, and um, one reason, one big reason for that was that um, both uh, Alex, my co-founder, and I, we have a philosophy that everybody should be doing, should be in their zone of genius, doing what they like and what, what they're good at. Uh, and nobody, no one of us was really experienced or or even that passionate about scaling organizations uh and that's what we were kind of the biggest thing we were looking for from uh, from a ceo uh teaching us and and doing that basically scaling the company because we realized that to do what we need to do we need a lot of people we need a big company it's a kind of a number of people and and size is not a kind of a desired outcome in itself, it is a necessity because the goals are so big that you can't do it with uh, 20 people or 30. How many employees did you have when you hired Brad? Uh, I think 20 something. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, around Nothing. I mean, small. Small. Did yeah. Yeah. We were fairly small. Uh, we were, we were, uh, making good revenue and being profitable at the time already. Uh, but the company was still very small. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, that that realization we need to their opportunity is big and we need to scale uh that pushed us to look for kind of external expertise how did you because at that point you i guess you didn't raise money so you and your partner like oh it was like your business it was your company and like your money how did you how did you not micromanage brad um because i did the same thing and not micromanaging is tough because you're like oh my god if you make a mistake you're gonna lose money and that's like my money and so it's like really stressful to like let someone fail sometimes and learn. Were you micromanaging or were you pretty emotionally healthy about it? 
I like to think we were emotionally healthy. Uh, maybe Brad would disagree. I don't know. I wish he, I actually will ask him. But um, I think part of it was out of necessity. There was just so much to do that if you micromanage, you get stuck. You don't you not make progress. So there was just no time or resources or energy to micromanage anybody. Uh, we had to divide and conquer to to actually keep making progress because uh, it's a it's a lot of work. So just just from the volume of things to do, everybody had to do their own thing. So that that happened naturally. And part of it is is a philosophy that again Alex and I share that basically if you bring in smart people on board, like not listening to them or not letting them think independently is a waste. Basically. There is no point in bringing smart people on board, uh, so that's uh, that's that made it easy to kind of uh, give freedom and give space to to Brad and, and other um, leadership team members. At what were your girl- goals early on? Like were, when you started the business, were you like, man, I think this can make ten million dollars a year and provide a good lifestyle, or like I think this could, <laughs> or was it like I think this could be like a multi billion dollar thing? Like, what were your girl- goals early on? Um, I think we decided that it could be a multi-billion dollar business during our conversations with Brad, partially. Uh, so kind of Alex and I, we, we, we hoped that it could be, but then once we started talking with Brad about valuation plans and all that, um, when he was thinking about joining, then it became pretty clear that yes, there is a multi-billion dollar market out there. Uh, are we gonna capture it or not to be dis- to be determined but um, at that point but uh, there is definitely an opportunity so the size of the opportunity became clear fairly early uh, but uh, past there that that took years to what go. was the vision that made or what what did you see that made you feel that it could be a multi-billion dollar opportunity and what was the vision and were there any was there any numbers that you saw? early on that would said like, oh my gosh, there's something here. Yeah, so I think the breakthrough moment was when we saw that it is possible to help not just professional writers, people who write for a living every day, but also help casual writers or people who write as part of their job but, or part of their life, but not like a key part. So writing is not their like main product. They're no, no like novelists or, or researchers who are published and so on. So when we saw that it's possible to make a product that's useful for everybody else, uh, then it clicked. Uh, And a very simple formula. If you look at amount of time we spend communicating and creating knowledge uh, as a humanity, as all people in the world, that is a huge percentage of our time. And it's increasing because we spend less time doing things with our hands. Manufacturing is being automated. It's not like we were doing it manually anymore uh, as much. So if you take this time that we spend communicating and creating knowledge and make it even 1% more effective, the impact is in trillions, not not even billions. Uh, So can we do something that makes communication 1% more effective on average for everybody? That doesn't sound impossible. That sounds like something is doable. Uh, that's doable. So, so we decided. I had that aim, same insight, except I did it in such a horrible, worse way. So basically, um, I learned how to be a copywriter. So, like, I read books on copywriting and like on persuasive writing, and my theory was like, oh my gosh, like with texting or like online dating. I, I was single at the time and in twenty one, so it was all about like dating. I'm like, oh man, if I were to learn how to write better in my messages to girls who I match with. Like my life is going to be better. And then I was like, wait a minute. If I learn how to write better, I could sell more stuff. If I learn how to write better, I can make people feel emotions about like this cause that I want them. I'm like, just writing better. Like it changes. It makes it life more practical, but also it, it uh, makes you think better. So like if you can, if you have an idea for something and you're forced to write it out, you'll see all the holes in the idea and you'll, and you'll force yourself to like lay it out. And so I was like, Oh, I'll teach people how to write better. And so I created a course on how to write better. Of course, like obviously creating a software product, it was out of my league, but like that was clearly the, the better move to do. But the same insight was like, everything that we do is via a text, whether it's a text message or an email or a website. And even if it's via like the spoken word, 
I have to write that anyway. So like writing is like the, the most important thing that you can master. I just wish I would have approached it in a software way as opposed to just selling a $300 course. Yeah, software is more scalable. That's, that's <laughs> true. And, uh, and actually, what, what you said about writing, uh, it also applies to speech. Uh, we, uh, when we do user research, we notice that um, people who use Grammarly repeatedly um, adopt patterns of communication, more effective patterns of communication, and translate it to uh, non-written communication as well. So, for example, if Grammarly keeps suggesting that you don't use kind of a wordy or vague or weak sentence structures, you stop or reduce use of them in speech as well. So I, so kind of good habits rub off and, and translate to other modes of communication. So here's my opinion. So have you ever heard of copy work? No. All right. So in like the um, 1700s, 1800s, and up until like 1910, one of the ways in America that we would teach children how to write well it's the same way that we would teach them how to play an instrument. So if I wanted to teach you how to play the piano, I'm not going to say like, go ahead, like write, go write a piano song. I would say, well, let's play Jingle Bells. Let's learn how to play Happy Birthday. Then after that, we can move to like some more pop songs that you really like. And then you do that for like two years and you like see patterns and you like understand you just copy other people's music. And in doing that, you see patterns. And then eventually you're like, oh, I know the rules to the game now. Now I can decide to follow them, to break them, but I can make my own. And it's the same thing with writing. Um, but we don't do that. And so what that means is I think one of the easiest ways to learn is you find great writing that you really like and you just literally copy it by hand. And in doing that, you like yeah. see the patterns and that's called copy work. It's not a very co popular way to learn how to write now, but in my opinion, it's one of the most powerful. I would say Grammarly in a sense, it's doing that because in real time you're learning, but it's far better than just saying like, go and write, like just like spend a lot of time writing your own stuff. I think copying other people is far better. Um, anyway, it's something I've been playing with. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm not a lot of people have heard of copy work. I thought maybe you would have, but uh, it's like not very well known. No, I haven't heard of it, uh, but I've seen it done in uh, many, many fields. Uh, like uh, at, at one point, I, I was passionate about photography. And uh, same there, you just basically try different, uh, try to basically copy different photographs and recreate them. And, and this way you learn the language of, of that art. Uh, so, so yeah, that applies to many, many areas. Were you, how technical were you and your co-founder? Were you technical enough to build the first handful of iterations? Um, uh, so I was very technical. Um, so for example, the pl previous, uh, plagiarism detection company, uh, I wrote, uh, the core, uh, the core algorithm and, and, uh, most of the uh, code originally, most of the kind of backend code, not the front end. Um, but when we were, uh, working on Grammarly, I don't think I did any production code. I coded some of the like experiments, landing pages, payment, checkout process, so, like some stuff. Stop, that, st stuff that you don't even need to code anymore today if you didn't want to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I coded some of that, but I didn't code uh, like a, like a real production grade stuff. Mostly because I'm uh, I'm not a formally a software engineer. I'm a, kind of a self trained coder, but uh, kind of building a real complex software is not my thing. Plus, I had to I had to manage the business full time. So uh, when we started out, uh, I was responsible for uh, finance, marketing, uh, like pretty much like lots, lots of things. Like basically everybody has to wear a lot of hats in a small company. So the running the business occupied pretty much my whole time. So was no time for, for. So you just hired, you, you, did you guys just self fund it and hire a couple of people to help build the first version? Uh, we hired quite a num quite a significant number of people. Uh, we also had a, a technical co-founder on board, um, a Dima leader, uh, who helped uh, build out the technical team. Uh, so he was responsible for um, uh, for the technical side uh, initially. Uh, but yeah, because of our previous exit, we had uh, um, some savings that we could put into Grammarly, some substantial savings we could put put into Grammarly. So basically, we were both founders and the first investors. How much time. did you spend to get the, to, to make it work until like it was a sellable product? Uh, 
I don't remember, but it was quite like a, a million was, or ten million, five hundred thousand. Do you remember? Uh, I think it was close to a million. Um, but it was a product that worked only for very small audience, very very small use case, and it was not real time. So basically, what happened was you write a book, a chapter of a book, because it couldn't check the whole book at, at once. Uh, or you write a research paper. You submit it to uh, the initial, like the old Grammarly, uh, and then you go make a cup of coffee, and then you drink the cup of coffee, and then you wait a little bit more, <laughs> and then it spits out the result. Uh, and the result was probably half of it was real issues, and half of it was false positives. But at the time, the audience, the, the target market was fine with that, because if you spent like two months writing a book, like what's extra half an hour to review all the potential issues, right? Even if they're not real. But that wouldn't fly with, uh, with business writers, for example. If you're writing a business email that you need to send in 20 seconds, you're not going to deal with false positives. And did that version get you to profitability? Yeah. No shit. What'd you charge for it? $100 a year? Uh... We charged, I think, ninety dollars a year, something like that. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, or hundred. So, yeah, I think ninety-five dollars a year. How did the people hear about it? The first users. Uh so that was uh, interesting because we launched two parallel streams: one to consumers and one to uh, businesses, uh, educational institutions, uh, publishers, uh, basic companies, consulting companies, and. Um, the consumer channel took off, like it grew exponentially from basically week one, uh, in enterprise or B2B, um, it took a longer to build. So once we kind of pushed both of them in parallel for about half a year, uh, we saw that, well, kind of makes sense to focus on consumer for now because it's just growing like wildfire. Uh, but, uh, B2B requires much more pushing, much more hiring, more people intensive because you need sales team and all that. So we kind of decided to slow roll it a little bit um, and focus on consumer for first few years. And was it through paid marketing or organic? Uh, we did everything. Um, we, we tried uh, all the channels available to us and uh, obviously different channels have different benefits. Um, at the time, social was also easier to, to get free, uh, promotion from, uh, right now, obviously kind of, uh, Facebook and others just want to capture all the value they create. Uh, but back then, uh, it was easy to get easier to get stuff viral and social and, and just get like, free promotion from that. Um, SEO was easier as well. Uh, so many things were just, uh, like many channels were, uh, quite easier to do. Uh, but we relied on paid uh, early on quite a bit uh, because it's uh, it's a very quick feedback loop. Uh, you design an ad, you send it, uh, or kind of put it in the system, and then you get back results like within hours. And it tells you if the message resonates, if there is a market for that, if you're finding that market correctly. You know that within like hours. Uh, it's a, in, in more traditional world, it's a weeks of market and hundreds research. of thousands of dollars. Uh, so, yeah. So that's, uh, that was, uh, that was kind of why we were so, uh, bullish on paid from early on, even though it costs a lot of money. Good. What companies are you guys trying to buy companies? Um, not specifically. I mean, we were open to that, uh, but, uh, we're not like hunting to buy companies. Is there a problem? that you need to be solved and then you saw that this other company was solving that problem that you'd buy it. So like, let me give you an example. The, uh, the founder of jet, you know, jet.com, they sold to yeah. Walmart for some billions of dollars. And he's like, man, if Walmart, if we could figure out a way how to reduce returns by helping people pick the right sizes, we would buy that company for a lot of money. Is there anything inside of Grammarly where like, man, we haven't figured out blank yet, but if someone did figure out blank, that's a cool company we would buy. That's a cool problem solved that we would buy. Uh, yeah, there, there are many things, um, like things around um, doing more on device. 
uh, like doing more and more processing on device. I think that 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 would be very interesting to us because uh, um, it it didn't, it enables uh, better user experience, lower lag, uh, potentially higher performance. Um, it also helps uh, alleviate some uh, potential privacy concerns. So kind of a uh, a no-brainer to do more stuff on device, and it's cheaper for 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 us to. Sorry, what, what, what does that mean? You mean it, like instead of you paying for all this cloud space for everything for the the for yeah yeah doing the, yeah calculating the suggestions on device. So basically, whenever uh, we say oh this needs to be shorter or we rephrase it, like that making that determination on your phone or on your laptop rather than sending it to cloud and and having our servers crunch the numbers. So that's, uh, that's kind of a, that, that, that has a number of benefits for, uh, for both us. I actually, I, I don't know what those costs are. So how much does it cost to ho like what percentage of your revenue do you spend on, or maybe like, how does the payroll compare the payroll cost compared to like your hosting costs? I, I would say it's comparable. Uh, hosting costs are like, even though we don't host much of the data, like we're not like Dropbox where we store files. Uh, but the processing, the processing is quite expensive, especially if you consider that we have uh, tens of millions of free users who are not paying us anything, uh, and uh, we're not, we don't monetize them in any way at all, because um, we don't, we don't sell user data, we don't show ads, we don't do any of that. Uh, so basically, all the free users are not monetized until they subscribe. Um, so that that makes it uh, that makes us be conscious of uh, processing costs, especially for regions where. Uh, not many people can upgrade to premium, uh, like developing countries. How many employees do you have? Uh, I don't recall exactly, but I, I would say somewhere around 800. Damn, so then you're paying a shit ton for those ho that hosting. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I would say it could be less than payroll. I, I don't remember exactly, uh, but uh, yeah, it is a significant amount. I mean, that, that many you supporting that many users uh, and providing a reliable service, it, it does. Who do you money. pay? Uh, it's mostly Amazon. Isn't that crazy, man? Like it, it just runs the internet. It's crazy. Well, yeah, we evaluate from time to time, bring in some things in house, um, and uh, actually some things we do have in house. Not uh, not necessarily like the the hosting infrastructure, but uh, like some train model training and all that stuff we do in house. Um, but uh, uh, so we we look into that. Uh, so it's not like we are just Amazon and forget it. Uh, but it is an effective way to scale business. It is an effective way to run. Yeah, it's just like crazy that it's crazy that it always freaks me out a little bit that like uh, we use Cloudflare, and I remember one time Cloudflare went out, and like our website was dead, and so was like a quarter of the internet. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it is um, uh, this concentration. It is kind of scary. Um, yeah, it freaks me out a little bit. Yeah, it it has its benefits, but it is uh, yeah. It, it, a lot of places have a single point of failure for significant portions of our uh, infrastructure. Are you? Uh, and we'll wrap up here in a second. But um, I uh, I asked you about Hemingway earlier. Do you do you view mm -hmm. them as competitors at all? Not really. No, they, they they do something that's similar and something that's basically part of what we do. And uh, number of people use both products simultaneously. So we don't view them as a competitor because they don't take business from us. Uh, so yeah, so it's not like. Competitor. Who do you view as a competitor? Uh, who do we view as a competitor? Well, the biggest one is complacency, just people not realizing that they can benefit from this. I think that that's the biggest thing that by far bigger than any any other competitor. Um, but other than that, once you get to a certain size, everybody becomes a potential competitor. Because, uh, you know, when you look at big tech companies, they all compete in some ways and all do some things that are similar or the same. So that's that's kind of the mindset that basically at any point, anybody can become a competitor. Yeah, but are there any, I've never seen any like upstarts or any small companies try to compete with you guys. Is there, is there many? Uh, there are some, uh, but most are uh, focusing on either a niche, like a primarily for a specific market. Um, 
And uh, I think that's that's a good way to start. And obviously, we're, we're watching them and, and seeing what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, and so on. Um, there, there, there's similar products. Uh, Microsoft, I think, has a similar product, but again, it, it only does part of what we do, uh, so it doesn't take away much business from us, if any. Um, so, so yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there are any kind of direct competitors at this point, um, and um, I'm not too worried about competition, frankly, because it's just such a new field. Uh, that most of the market is just untouched by anybody. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on. I'm going to, uh, we're going to wrap up now and, uh, I'm going to let you know when this is live. It should be live in like a week, I think, but I appreciate you coming on. It means a lot. Uh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.